future Sebi here, super fast, but if you're not happy with the changes that we talk about later in the video, then consider the city premiere. The reason I'm talking about it right now is because they do have an elevated offer that does end very, very soon. For the current window, it's 80,000 thank you points after $4,000 of minimum spend in the first three months. At a minimum, that's $800 in your bank account and upwards of $1,600 or $2,400 if you value it at two to three cents per point and you care about aspirational travel. There is a $95 annual fee, but there is a downgrade path to a lot of other cards like the double cash if it doesn't make sense in year two. Also, it's just generally a good card as an earner because you get 3x back for dining, grocery stores, and also gas stations, which tends to be a pretty difficult category. I'll link to a calculator below if you want to crunch the numbers, and if you are someone that wants to learn more about the card, then consider using the links also down below or on AskSebi.com. But let's dive into today's video. Flashback to 2020 when international travel grounded to a standstill and people debated canceling the travel cards. Chase did something that was surprising the most. When other issuers were adding temporary credits, they added a whole entire new way to redeem your points and for elevated value. This idea was called Pay Yourself Back or PYB, and it was exactly that. The idea was that you could redeem your points for that elevated value that was normally restricted to just travel, but for everyday purchases, effectively paying yourself back. In today's video, we are talking about some pretty major changes to this program, and towards the middle, we'll talk about why I think this is happening. Given that this is a pretty major change, big favor is to give this a thumbs up to help with the algorithm so other people can see this, and if you are new here, consider subscribing. As a quick refresher, the Chase Sapphire Preferred, Sapphire Preserve, and Chase Inc. Preferred allow you to redeem your points for elevated value when you book travel through their portal. For the CSP and CIP, it's 1.25 cents per point, and for the CSR, it's 1.5 cents per point. If you're new, that might sound confusing, so let's say you have 100,000 points. At 1.25 cents per point, that's $1,250 towards travel, and 1.5 cents per point is $1,500 towards travel. The allure of pay yourself back is that you're getting that $1,250 or $1,500, but towards groceries, gas, and other everyday things. From May 2020 to December 2022, more than two and a half years, that was exactly the case. The categories did swap and they did bring in some partners, but you could reasonably rely on this. As a full in January of 2023, this whole system is taking a hit. Let's start with the Sapphire Reserve. You are still getting 1.5 cents per point, but this is only going to be for select charities, and this is through December 31st of 2023. As of now, for the non-charity options, it's actually dropping down to 1.25 cents per point. And again, this is for the CSR, the Sapphire Reserve. Through March 31st of 2023, you're getting 1.25 cents per point for grocery stores, gas stations, as well as the annual fee. Note that Chase often does extend these categories, so if you are watching in the summer or in the fall, it might still be these ones. As you can tell, this is a pretty major hit, and you are losing a bunch of basis points. For the Sapphire Preferred and the Freedoms, you're only getting 1.25 cents per point for select charities. Of the bunch, I'd argue that the CSP probably got hit the hardest because it's not even getting anything more. If anything, there might be a case to upgrade from the CSP to the CSR. For the Ink Preferred and the Ink Plus, you're getting 1.25 cents per point towards shipping, as well as internet, cable, and phone services. So technically, nothing is changing over here. It's still solid value in its categories that are relevant. Pretty much the same idea for the Ink Cash and the Ink Unlimited, 1.1 cents per point towards shipping, as well as internet, cable, and phone services. If anything, the no annual fee inks are probably the winners of the bunch because they're getting elevated value and they're not taking a hit. It also helps that they're relevant categories and it's no annual fee cards. Okay, so is this the end of Chase cards? For Team Cashback, maybe, but I'd argue that there's still a ton of value. For example, the Chase Sapphire Preferred almost always has an intro bonus of at least 60,000 points for $4,000 of spend in the first three months. In the past, Pay Yourself Back meant 60,000 points was 750 in value, and now it's just 600. $600 back from the intro bonus minus a $95 annual fee, and you're still netting $505. 505 divided by $4,000 as a minimum spend is 12.6% return on spend, which is pretty solid. If you're on team travel, then I'd argue nothing's happening and nothing to worry about. If anything, Chase is just going back on course of what they previously did and the whole point of the card. So more so a travel card rather than a lifestyle card. For example, the CSP, if it was a 60,000 point intro bonus, that's still 750 towards travel. If you're someone normal and doing normal basic travel and booking through their portal, then that's pretty good value. It is what it is. Most people are probably doing at least one trip a year, whether to visit family or to do some type of vacation, so it does tend to work out. On a side note, if you do want to learn about cards and support the channel, we do have links on the website, asksebi.com, and down below in the description box. Make sure that the links are competitive and actually good for you, but otherwise, it is a huge way to support the channel, so thank you guys in advance. 
For people who are looking for elevated value, you were always transferring your points out to partners anyways, rather than booking through the portal or using Pay Yourself Back. Those were options, but those were things that you didn't use. So for example, right now I am at the Hyatt Centric in Park City and it's 35,000 points per night, or if you wanted to pay the retail price, 700 to 1,000 a night. It's definitely expensive, but that's the nature of skiing and skiing properties during the winter season. 700 divided by 35,000 points is two cents per point. Two cents is great value, way better than pay yourself back or booking through their portal. If you wanted to do an Airbnb or look at a cheaper chain, it's still pretty expensive. Taking a look at the map of where I currently am, there's 700, 800, 1200, 2500, all pretty expensive. The one exception is going to be 285. If we double click into that one though, we do see that it's only from one site and I'm not sure how shady or not shady it is. If Priceline, Expedia, Hotels.com, and even the site themselves is giving you about 500, I don't trust the 285 link. Main takeaway is that if you are a traveler, then I'd argue that you're not affected by this because you were redeeming points towards business or first anyways, or towards trips like this, or to the Maldives or Bora Bora, or Hawaii, or a ton of other places where you get outsized value and great use of points. The big question I have, and probably you have, is why is Chase doing this? I think there's five reasons and let's dive into them. Number one is the overuse of pay yourself back. So they probably had more people use it than they expected. But most programs they project it and see how it lands and this might have just been way more than they thought it would be. Number two, relatedly, it might have brought people that weren't their prime audience. So for example, I wouldn't be surprised if there were more team cash back now getting to Chase Sapphire Preferred and Chase Sapphire Reserve because they know they could get elevated value from those points without ever traveling. On one hand, that's good because you have more people getting the card. On the other hand, if they're not spending on the card, then that also hurts them. Banks make a ton of money from interchange fee, so when you swipe the card when you use it, they get a cut of that. If anything, I'd argue that for the prime issuers, the ones that are less focused on collecting interest, that's to their whole business model. Number three, the fact that travel is back in full swing. So they made this program because people couldn't travel, but if people can now travel, then why have this program still? If anything, this feels like kind of a middle ground test of what would happen and people's opinions when they pull it a little bit, but before doing a full poll. Number four, something that I was pretty hesitant to talk about, but just easy abuse will pay yourself back. For some programs, it was pretty easy to book, use your points, and then get a refund. Great for us and people who wanted to cash out their points, but probably bad for the program. Number five, and it probably relates to all of this, is that it was probably unprofitable. I think Chase is fine doing something if it's a loss leader and they see that the money's coming back in the future, but if it's not going to be profitable, even in the long run, then it just doesn't make sense. It's actually interesting because you could argue that this is the core premise of points. Across all the relationships, there is this form of arbitrage. Chase is giving you 35,000 points that you can redeem for $350 in cash. Alternatively, if you want to get more value, you could get 35,000 Hyatt points instead. For me, I'm redeeming it for a night that's going to cost $700. I'm getting value, I'm happy, but Hyatt is also not paying $700 out of pocket. So generally corporate ends up paying the hotel itself a smaller amount of money. Let's say maybe $350 or $400. The reason the hotel is willing to do that is because first off, it's part of their hotel program to be part of Hyatt, that they have some nights that are available for this. And number two, the fact that there are usually some vacancies. If you're given the choice between 700 in cash or 350 in these points, obviously you take 700, but if the room's not going anywhere anyways, then you'll happily take 350. So you could argue that across all of the layers, it's a win-win-win. Chase is probably paying less money out of pocket, we're getting more value, Hyatt Corporate is also getting value from this, and the hotel is getting utility from their empty room. The fundamental problem of Pay Yourself Back is that it doesn't have an arbitrage. At 1.5 cents per point, with 35,000 Chase points, it wasn't just 350 out of pocket, but 525. You were redeeming it as a statement credit. Chase doesn't have any other agreement directly with that grocery store chain, so they're not getting a discount on that. In effect, Chase only really had two choices, nerf the program like we're seeing, or increase the annual fee to make it profitable. Okay, so what happens next? My initial prediction was that Pay Yourself Back was going to add a bunch of other brand partnerships, and basically they continued down that path. So for example, if Lyft or Instacart needed more users for Q1 or something, then they could always have that as a perk. Or let's say Chipotle. If Chase negotiated a lower rate on the back end, then Chipotle doesn't really care because they're getting more users in, but they're not losing out too much money. As long as they're getting their direct cost, then they're happy. It's a weird problem because you have to find brands that want Chase's traffic, but also don't mind taking that hit. So even though Chipotle might benefit from that traffic, I'd argue that they don't need it. Number one, Chase needs to find these brands that are struggling, or number two, find these startups and other tech companies that are trying to rapidly get users. For number one, I think they eventually will find a list and group of these companies that they'd want to work with that make sense on both sides. 
The big issue for number two right now is that there are a lot of layoffs and the marketing budgets for a lot of these tech companies are getting pulled back. In the past, Away, Airbnb were happy to do these partnerships because they had the money to spend. But right now, when things aren't looking as well, then they're going to try to cut back. I wouldn't be surprised if they eventually relaunched this and it does end up working, but I think it is going to be a longer term process. If I had to guess, I would think it would be retail, so the big box chain stores. Think JCPenney or Macy's, things that are kind of still alive but in a zombie state. Or as Mandy just told me in the background, Kmart. In the meantime, call me crazy, but I would not be surprised if the Chase Sapphire Reserve's annual fee ends up increasing. Given that other issuers are kind of doing the same thing, and there's also other cards being launched, it makes sense to do a refresh. In the meantime, before any of this happens, there is the question of whether you should upgrade the Sapphire Preferred to the Sapphire Reserve, given the elevated value. Main takeaway from all of this is that Chase giveths and then Chase takeoffs. If you're on Team Cashback, you might be hit, and on Team Travel, nothing is happening, you're still a happy camper. Again, if you do want to learn about cards, we have links on the website, asksebi.com, down below in the description box. If you made it to this point in the video, then leave an airplane emoji in the comments down below, and I'll try to heart it and also respond. My question for you is what are your thoughts on these changes, and are you someone that's still happy using Chase, or are you going to abandon it? Let me know and everyone else know in the comments down below. Big favor, give this a thumbs up, consider subscribing, but otherwise, hope you guys liked it. See you guys next time.